Sister Sumayya from Doha, Qatar emails. And she says that she owns a lot of gold jewelry and that she uses some of the uh, jewelry uh, weekly and some of it she uses very rarely and she is confused about whether she has to give zakat on this jewelry or not. As far as paying zakat on gold and silver jewelry, if a person is using it, the difference of opinion. One group of scholars say that zakat may not be given, while the other group of scholars say that zakat should be given. According to the scholars like uh, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, and Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, may Allah have mercy on them, all of them say that zakat need not be given on gold and silver jewelry if it is being used. Based on the hadith of Al Bahaki, where Jabir ibn Abdullah, may Allah be pleased with him, when he was asked, that is zakat liable on gold and silver jewelry if it is being used. He said that zakat is not liable even if it's a thousand dinar. A thousand dinar worth of gold, then zakat is not liable. It's mentioned in the hadith of Bihaki that Asma binti Abi Bakr, the daughter of Hazab Abu Bakr, may Allah with him, she used to put jewelry on her children, on her daughters, and the jewelry was more than 50,000 dinar of gold. But yet she never used to pay zakat. And another hadith which is mentioned in Mount Tal Malik, that Hazrat Aisha may Allah be pleased with her, the wife of the Prophet, she used to take care of her nieces who wore gold jewelry, but she never paid zakat on that. So based on this hadith, all the hadiths I say, based on these three hadiths and other some hadith, that these scholars say that zakat need not be given. But the other group of scholars, like Abu Hanifa, Ibn Hazm, may Allah have mercy on them. These group of scholars, they say that zakat should be given on gold jewelry, even if it's worn. And they give various verses of the Quran and the Hadith. For example, Allah says in the Quran, in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, verse number 34 and 35, that as to those who hoard gold and silver, and spend it not in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning those who don't give zakat, announce to them a grievous penalty. And that wealth will be heated in the fire of hell. And with that, they'll be branded on their forehead, on their flanks and on the back. And it will be told to them that have the taste of wealth that he hoarded. So here it says that anyone does not give zakat on gold and silver, hoard it and don't give zakat, you'll be banned with fire. So based on this verse of the Quran, they say irrespective of whether you're using it or not, you have to pay zakat. And the hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in Sahih Muslim, volume number two, in the book of Zakat, hadith number 2161, that all those who hoard gold and silver and spend it on the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a plate of fire would be made on the day. And they would be heated in the hellfire, and with them, they would be branded on the flanks, on the forehead, and on the backs. And then he recited the verse of the Quran of Surah Al-Imran chapter 3 verse 780 that those who do not spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And further, there is a hadith of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam which is mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number 2, in the book of Zakat, hadith number 1558, where a lady comes along with her daughter wearing two heavy bangles of gold. And when they approached the Prophet, the Prophet asked that, have you paid zakat on that? So they said no. So the Prophet said that, do you want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put bangles of fire around your hands? So immediately that lady, she removes the bangles and gives it to the Prophet and says, I give it in the way of Allah and his Rasul. There's another hadith mentioned in Sunan Abu Dawud, volume number two, in the book of zakat, hadith number 1560. Hazrat Aisha may Allah be pleased with her, the wife of the Prophet. One day, she wears two rings of silver, and the Prophet enters and sees these two rings of silver. So he asks her, now what is this? So she says, that I made myself for you, a messenger of Allah. So the Prophet asked her, that did you pay zakat? So she says, no, or as Allah wills. So the Prophet replies, that is sufficient for you to take you to hellfire. 
So based on this hadith, the scholars say that zakat is fard on the jewelry, even if it's worn, if it contains gold and silver. And the second ruling of the scholars that zakat is fard is more stronger and is more correct, though they are different opinion, but that is more followed by the people. And because better give zakat rather than stay away from it, it always gets sawab in that. Therefore, most of the scholars agree in the second view. Though the scholars do differ, among the scholars who say zakat is not fard on gold and silver jewelry is Jabir ibn Abdullah, Abdullah ibn Umar, Asma bint Abi Bakr, Milla be pleased with them all, Imam Malik, Imam Shafi, Imam Ibn Hanbal, may Allah have mercy on them. These scholars say that zakat is not fard. But the other group of scholars say zakat is fard. Amongst them, we have Hazrat Umar ibn al Khattab, may Allah be pleased with him, Abdullah ibn Masood, Abdullah ibn Abbas. We have Sufyan Thawri, may Allah be pleased with them all, Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah have mercy on him, Ibn Muntib, Ibn Hazm, may Allah have mercy on them all, and Sheikh Utaymi, Sheikh bin Baz, may Allah have mercy on them all. So all these scholars, they say that zakat is fard on gold jewelry, if it reaches the Nisab level. If it doesn't reach, it's not fard. And the second view that is fard is more authentic, is more stronger, but there are different opinions among the scholars. Now, this question, dear sister, is one of the classical questions of Islamic fiqh and law. Every single student of knowledge and every single scholar is going to spend quite a lot of time studying this issue because this controversy erupted not in my time, not in your time, not in the generation before, it erupted in the generation of the companions themselves. And we have major companions on both sides of this issue. And all of the books of fiqh have chapters about this. And the four schools developed arguments and counter arguments. And we find obviously, I mean, to be simplistic, we'll say there are two opinions. In reality, there are some nuances in, in the one opinion, but for simplicity, simplicity sake, let's just say, there are two opinions. Obviously, one opinion is you give zakat, the other opinion is you do not give uh, zakat. So there are two opinions. And I will go into who said what. But before I do that, I want to keep on bringing up the issue of methodology, the issue of why am I doing it this way? And, uh, you know, why am I going into all of the different opinions and then, uh, you know, explaining them? I do so primarily, primarily, so that we learn to tolerate and respect, so that whatever opinion we choose, we do not demonize or criminalize somebody who follows another legitimate opinion. So what are you gonna do when uh, Ibn Umar was on one side of the equation and Aisha was on the other side? What are you going to do when two major companions have different views about this? What are you gonna do when Abu Huraira says one thing and Umar bin Khattab says another? Uh, Mu'adh bin Jabal says one thing and uh, uh, Zayd bin Thabit says another. What are you going to do? You have to understand that from the beginning of our religion, certain issues were agreed upon. We all agree, we pray five times a day. We all agree, we must have the wudu, face the qibla, etc. And certain issues were left slightly gray and the scholars and fuqaha and tabi'un, they differed amongst themselves. So, what should you do, sister? Sister, you're asking me, Sister Sumayya, you're asking me, uh, what sh is, is zakat given or not? And I say to you, what is your methodology when it comes to fiqh and fiqhi issues? Do you, generally speaking, follow one of the established madhabs? If you do, then every time a sheikh is asked a question, make sure that you listen if he's like me and he gives all of the opinions, generally speaking. Find out which madhab you know, you're gonna be following, like if you're Hanafi or Shafi'i, when he says the Hanafi say this, follow it, and end of story. And this has been the default position of the majority of the ummah, and that's a good thing to do, because it brings about a level of consistency. That's the good thing. When you follow a school of law, then you are being holistically consistent. You are being consistent in the paradigm, in the methodology, in the derivation. You are basing your opinions on a vast body of scholarship that goes back 1,200 years, and it is quite established. Whichever school you follow is great. So this is the default, the historical default, and it is one that I also encourage, no problem. If the school you were born in is Hanafi, follow the Hanafi school. If it's Shafi'i, follow the Shafi'i school. No big deal. Or 
if you feel that uh, I don't want to study all of these, yani the, the school and whatnot, and whenever an issue comes, I will ask a scholar and I'll just follow that scholar and that's fine for me. I'm gonna take a scholar that, or you follow one particular scholar that you like overall, and you just say whatever the Shaykh, I trust him in his judgment, and I'm just gonna follow this Shaykh. And this Shaykh is inshallah a person of repute, a person of knowledge, a person of Iman and Taqwa, and he or she understands the situation, no problem. You may follow this person, and either way, you are following a learned authority. So, I will go over the various opinions, and I will you know, um, uh, 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 conclude with my own as well, and then it is up to you if you follow a madhab that is fine, choose the madhab, and if you uh, wish for my opinion, I will uh, incorporate it very gently within the, and who am I compared to these great giants? So think of this as well, anytime somebody says the correct opinion is, well, that's his version of the correct opinion. Realize this, right? If Imam al-Shafi'i held an opinion, Abu Hanifa held an opinion, then really anybody in our times who says the correct opinion is, yani, we have to just you know, uh, take it with a grain of salt. I have the right to hold an opinion, but I have respect the right of the other people to think that their opinion is right. There's a big difference between the two. So this issue of zakat on uh, jewelry, let us firstly understand what are we talking about here? We're talking about gold or silver jewelry that is intended for decoration and personal use. This excludes jewelry that is not gold and silver. Your jewelry in your house that is diamonds, that is rubies, that is emeralds, that is platinum, the jewelry that you beautify yourself with, and it is these other stones, there is no zakat on that. It's your beautification. This also excludes the jewelry that is not meant for personal use. So for example, the merchant who is a jeweler and he sells and buys jewels and he sells and buys gold and he sells and buys necklaces and, uh, necklaces and bracelets, that person's zakat is different. So we're talking about gold and silver jewelry that is personal. That's what we're talking about right now. That is used by you or meaning by used, uh, you know, you, you, the intention is, I'm gonna wear it at a wedding or something. The intention is not to buy and sell. That's not the primary intention. Obviously, everybody will sell something when a ma massive price is offered. We're not talking about that. We're talking about why do you have it in your, uh, uh, in your possession? You bought it because you liked it. You bought it because you wanted to wear it. You bought it or you were gifted it at your wedding and you're like, I like this and I'm gonna give it to my daughter to wear in her wedding. So the point is, it's for decoration purposes. Now, obviously, it has value. Everybody knows that, but you did not buy it to buy and sell, that's not your goal. Neither was it gifted to you to buy and sell, it was gifted for you to wear. So that's what we're talking about. When it comes to personal jewelry, gold and silver, this is where we get to, for your usage, we get to our two opinions here. The majority opinion, and this is the uh, Shafi'i opinion, and the majority of the Hanbali school, uh, and the Maliki school. Uh, and there are some Shafi'is who disagree and some Malikis, uh, sorry, and some Ham Hanbalis who disagree, but the default of the Shafi'is and the Hanbalis and the Malikis, the majority of the three, is that there is no zakat on your personal jewelry that is gold and silver. There is no zakat on the jewelry that you want to beautify yourself with and you own, and it is gold and uh, silver. And uh, this is the majority position of the ummah. And they have a number of evidences that they go into uh, of them is that uh, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in, in, the, in, surah, in the Quran, in Surah At-Tawbah, وَالَّذِينَ يَكْنِزُونَ الذَّهَبَ وَالْفِضَّةَ وَلَا يُنْفِقُونَهَا فِي سَبِيلِ اللَّهِ فَبَشِّرٌ بِعَذَابٍ أَلِيمٍ Those who keep as treasures gold and silver, and they don't spend it in the way of Allah, those people will be punished a severe punishment. Those who keep as treasures gold and silver. The reference here, according to the majority, is clearly gold and silver coins. That's what is kept as treasures. The, 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 the necklace and the bracelets and the earrings doesn't come under yaknizun or kenz. You don't call it the, the treasure that you're investing in, no. So they use the Quranic term kenz and they say personal jewelry, huli, is not kenz. And so it's, we're not gonna consider it to be uh, under this ayah and therefore uh, it, is not, it is not something that uh, will have zakat. And they also uh, use, they also use the famous hadith 
uh, in Sahih Bukhari that our Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said Tasaddaqna ya ma'ashar al-nisai walaw min huliyikunna Give sadaqah, O Ansari ladies, even if it is from your jewelry. Now they say, give sadaqah, even if it's from your jewelry. He didn't say zakat is obligatory. He said, give sadaqa, tasaddaqna, even if it is from your jewelry. And sadaqa is voluntary. Sadaqa is not obligatory. This is, they're being technical here, that he used the term sadaqa, and he says, give sadaqa, even if it is from your uh, jewelry. And uh, they also bring about other evidences as well. Uh, of them is that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that there is no uh, zakat due on less than five uqiyya of silver. Five uqiyya of silver. Now uqiyya is a weight measurement that was used for silver coins. So you would weigh the coins or, or pure silver. So they say the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu is bringing a weight measurement for silver coins indicates that he wasn't worried about necklaces and jewelry. And so he's saying when you have coins, because obviously if you have silver coins and gold coins that you are using for uh, currency, there is zakat on that if it is above the nisab. So they say the fact that the Prophet Sallallahu mentioned that if it is less than five uqiyya of gold, of silver coins, there is no zakat due, indicates he didn't tell the people, add your lady's jewelries. He is literally saying, according to this narration, that, uh, or inferring you can say, that only silver coins have uh, zakat on them. So this is some evidences and they have other evidences as well. Of them is they say that, uh, is they say that, uh, the general rule, and this is their strongest evidence if you ask me, their strongest evidence. The general rule is that whatever is for your personal use is not zakatable. This is an English Arabic term which is now common in textbooks by the way. Zakatable, you will not find it in the Oxford Dictionary, but inshallah one day you will. We need to add this term, zakatable, because it's very perfect, we need to use it in English now. So what is zakatable? By unanimous consensus, the clothes that you wear, the house that you live in, the car that you use, the horse and camel or the horses and camels that are for your personal use, you don't give zakat on them, okay? That it's your personal use, the one that you're riding, that's not zakat, no zakat on that one. So they say that just like if you had horses and camels, uh, to buy and sell, horses and camels to benefit from their milk and their meat and to buy and sell, there would be zakat on that. But not the horse or camel that you ride, your personal beast that you ride, there is no zakat. So they say gold and silver that is converted to jewelry is like the camel that instead of it being used for meat and for milk and whatnot, which would be zakatable, you're using it for your personal riding, not zakatable. So too, according to them, that which is used for your personal use is exempt from zakat by unanimous consensus. And the rule is correct, except when it comes to gold and silver, the other school says that's an exception. This is the point here. The rule is correct. Does the rule have an exception? The other school says it does. These three schools says no, there is no exception. The rule is the rule. What is the rule? That which is for your daily usage is not zakatable. That's the rule. And what, what comes under this? Your car, your house that you live in. In contrast to the house that you're renting out or whatnot, the house that you live in, uh, your clothes, okay? Uh, uh, your, your desk, your furniture. If you owned a furniture shop, buying and selling furniture, there is zakat on that. The furniture in your house, there's no zakat on that. So too, this group argues, if you had gold and silver for currency, there's zakat on that. When you have gold and silver for personal use, the lady has the jewelry, there is no zakat on that. So this is the majority position, and it is, uh, as we said, it has very strong evidences in its own way. Who's left? the Hanafi school. And also in our times, a number of the modern Salafi scholars as well, uh, Ibn, Ta uh, sorry, uh, Ibn Baz and Ibn Uthaymin and others, uh, Allah uh, they're also uh, very strict on this issue, that there is zakat on gold. There is zakat on gold and silver jewelry. And they, and this is the Hanafi position, by the way, as well. This is the default of the Hanafi uh, position. And uh, the, uh, the evidences that they have are uh, quite a lot. They have a number of evidences for this. And of them, 
is the exact same verse that was used by the majority. And they say, Allah says, those who keep gold and silver as treasures. And so they said, the jewelry is gold and silver. So they jumped to dhahab and fiddah. Group number one jumped to the yaknizun, treasure. Group number two said dhahab and fiddah and we'll ignore the first, or you know, we'll interpret the first one. So they said by unanimous consensus, you know, uh, gold and silver jewelry is still called gold and silver, right? Just because it's jewelry is still called gold and silver and therefore it will come under this uh, verse. And uh, they have a number of uh, traditions as well. That of them, uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, anybody who owns gold or silver and does not give its right shall be punished on the Day of Judgment. The hadith goes on. So the Prophet Sallallahu said, anybody who owns gold and silver, and they said, jewelry is still gold and uh, silver. Jewelry is still gold and silver. And uh, they also mentioned, uh, the uh, the issue of uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam asking a lady that have you given charity on uh, what she is wearing and she said I have so then the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said well if you had not then what you are wearing would actually be a source of punishment uh, for you and there are a number of traditions of the of the Sahaba and Tabi'un, uh, of them the, that indicate both of these sides, that you give zakat on jewelry, you don't give zakat on uh, jewelry. So the point being that uh, you do have strong opinions on both sides, and uh, there are logical and rational and textual evidences that both of these camps use. So what am I going to add that hasn't been added for the last 14 centuries, nothing. There's nothing to be added over here. My advice to you, sister, is really to follow uh, your school, whichever it is. And uh, me personally, uh, in my own uh, life and in you know my own families and whatnot, uh, this is an awkward thing to say, even though I believe that the majority opinion makes more sense, still in this case, I follow the minority opinion, which is the Hanafi opinion, simply because it is the safer one and because uh, my conscience is then clear that it is something that uh, I feel clear clear about. And also, uh, there does seem to be you know one or two ahadith that are a little bit explicit in this regard. Uh, the other school interprets those ahadith as we explained in their ways, and there's nothing wrong with that. Nonetheless, um, if you were to follow your school of law, whatever it is, you are perfectly safe and fine. Uh, in the end of the day, this is a legitimate controversy. So either you follow your school, or uh, if you ask me, uh, perhaps the safest opinion is that you actually do give uh, zakat, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. And with that, inshallah, we come to the conclusion of today's uh, lesson. Inshallah, we'll continue next week. Jazakumullahu khairan. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.